Well, thank you all very much for coming here um, and supporting Pro Center. You guys are, what are keeping us alive um, and will continue to keep us alive. If we have a product you don't see that we carry, certainly just let us know and if we can get access to it, we'll get it in here. We're still even in this three month, four month mode of startup mode. So uh, again, we don't have everything that's made. We don't want to have everything that's made. But if there's something you're looking for and you don't see here, just let us know, we'll get it in here. Um, so why am I talking? I don't know. Um, no, I've done, uh, I've been in photography since I was 18. So that's been about, it's been 30 years now. Um, 10 years. No, 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 you say 10. I can say 30. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay, I admit it. Uh, done many, 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 many weddings. Uh, all wonderful, of course. All cooperative. Always having perfect light. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, learned very quickly in my wedding career that the adults act like children and the children just act like they're supposed to. Um, and they're fine. But... Always, always trying to find that light. I mean, one thing that I always enjoyed about weddings was, I, I bless you, Thank you, very much was that there was the structure of the studio that I worked with, because I worked for a studio most of my career. Um, they had their checklist. They had their demands. The bride had their demands. The groom had his demands. The bride's mother had her demands. So any of you that are out just shooting weddings, and who's that? Who's shooting weddings? I mean, you guys realize this, right? You've got like at least a dozen bosses. And then there's those 300 guests that think they're your boss too. Um, and they kind of are, if you want to keep working, right? You got to pay attention and do these things. But I learned pretty quickly in photography that um, personality is key. You've got to have a good personality. You've got to be a good people person. You've got to put customer service first, OK? You can be an average photographer. Not that I was, but um, you can be an average photographer. But if you've got the people skills and that customer service set up all to back them up and take care of them, they're going to be more understanding if something happens. Now, if you're a pompous jerk, if you've got attitude, you've got an edge all the time, um, Sonia. Um, <coughs> hey, your husband's backing me up back there. He's like, yeah, get her, get her, get her. Um, but if you've got that attitude and you're real negative, now there's not really this cush for you making mistakes. So now you really better be on your game because they're going to try to find things wrong with your photos. And then one thing that I saw a lot that happened with me was from you know weddings back in 1985 to weddings now is, God, we thought they were demanding in 85 in Chicago because at that time the East Coast and West Coast shot primarily medium format and the Midwest shot 35 millimeter. It was more affordable for the equipment. It was more affordable for the film. It was more affordable for the processing. So it was more, more, more. So we took more, more, more. They had more pictures to choose from. So the East Coast and West Coast were doing four hours of coverage, and the Midwest was doing 14 hours, right, Jan? We were doing 14 hours of coverage, OK? 14 hours, I'm sure a few of you do that. That means you better not be taking the same photo all day, right? So you've got to have your posing game on. You've got to have your lighting game on. You've got to have your customer service game. And you really have got to start being a person that can read people and understand people how they interact with each other, you're the hired help. They might smile at you one way and talk to you one way and completely different to their family and completely different to their friends. But we've got to pick up on those skills and watch what they're doing. But part of that whole different all day is watching the light, paying attention to the light, OK? This is one of my favorite photos that I've taken. Um, is it award winner? No, I've never entered it in anything. Is there something wrong with that? I'm sure there is. Um, but the cool thing about it was, is I got my brand new 7200, you know, way back when, um, the first VR from Nikon, and uh, was playing with it Easter morning. Some of you heard the story. My son was just sitting on the couch. Um, can someone just flip those lights back there real quick, just so you can see this better? Who's about to? Someone exploding? I don't know. Let me try the typical speaker thing. If you have a cell phone, please be courteous, courteous enough to yourself and to your fellow people to turn off your lights. Actually, that might be the alarm back there. That's what I think it is, the alarm. <laughs> Which is, that's probably them setting it up there. This will be perfect for the video. <laughs> and then the speaker of the building, I can't change it, sorry. So anyway, um, pay attention to the light. So I was playing with my 7200, and because of my skill set, because of the fact that I had worked with off-camera lighting and, and getting that direction coming from off the camera, I was able to see this photograph. I can't take credit for being the guy who totally set up the lights, because I didn't. I was in the right place at the right time and noticed it. 
you know, Oprah walks around talking about luck. Luck's not being in the right place, right time. It's being ready for the opportunity when it's being given to you. And that's where I become a little bit of a photo snob to people. If you're going to call yourself a photographer, you need to learn photography. We need to learn to understand our cameras. Okay, and I'm not a big techno geek. Right, John? Okay. Um, but I understand what all the fundamentals are of what it's doing. Okay, and I understand how the light can enhance the person or destroy the person. I can make you look pretty ugly. Okay? You just try. <laughs> Sonia, come here. <laughs> Sorry, you dealt the deck. I'm just playing with it. So would you say this is Sonia at her best? <laughs> you better. <laughs> Jose's like, that's just another day in my house. <laughs> Clean the dishes. <laughs> You're out of here. OK? So that's all about us playing with direction of light. We can completely make that person look completely different. OK? I can use flatter light to hide wrinkles. I can use more dramatic directional light to show off more wrinkles. I can hide the bags under your eyes. I can show off the bags under your eyes. I can shove that giant mole on your forehead. I can hide that mole on your forehead. I can enhance your crooked nose, or we can straighten out your crooked nose. Okay? I mean, the cool thing is for the people who really learn photography, you don't have to spend as much time in Photoshop. Okay? Photoshop, to me, has never been the creation of the image. It can be the enhancing of the image, but it shouldn't be the creation of the image, in my opinion. Okay, which is, I think, Bert mentioned in his talk when he talked here that there's actually a separate category now in judging of what you created in your camera and then what you created afterwards. Okay, because they are two very different things. But again, when I hear people complain about how much time they spend, and you've all heard it, and please don't tell me or raise your hand that you've done it, but because I'm going to be the bad guy. But they come and complain about how, you know, I shot my wedding, and it was 14 hours, and now it's another 14 hours in editing. You know, unfortunately, when you say that to me, what do you think I hear? Didn't get it in the camera. Yeah, I, I hear that I'm so bad that it's going to take me another 14 hours to fix all my bad stuff. You know what I mean? Now, I didn't have that luxury. I worked for a studio. So the good news of working for a studio is that you are forced a little bit into a box. You do get some creativity, but you're forced into a box. They've got 100 photographers that are working for them. Okay, they need to get those pictures into a lab and out of a lab for as cheap as they possibly can. So do you think they get out of there cheaper if they're enhancing and fixing all the pictures? No way, right? More manpower means more money. None of us want to spend more money. Um, Ryan Shembri, he, I heard him speak. Um, he's from Australia. Some of you should know his name. He's huge. <laughs> Does great pictures. Good friend of Jerry's. Um, Kionis. Um, but he, at that time, I don't know if he still does, but at that time he had talked about actually sending his processing to India. You know, and he was paying far less to have that, that digital editing done through India, but he was still paying money. And if you've ever seen him shoot, you know they're not fixing a lot of what he's doing because he knows what he's doing. Okay? So that's what I want to help you guys get to is that point of knowing what you're doing. And unfortunately, you know, there's these four levels of competence that we've got to deal with. You know what I mean? There's an unconscious incompetence. You're so dumb, you don't know how dumb you are. Or to be more politically correct, you're just so non-exposed to something. You've never had to experience something. You've never had to learn something that you don't know what you're supposed to do. So if you're walking around saying you're a photographer because you've got this cool camera and you've taken some cool pictures, that's great that randomly we can produce great pictures. Okay, But I don't want a surgeon who randomly does a good job. Right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want a chef who randomly does a good job. Right? Either they're a chef, they know what they're doing, or they don't. I don't want to go to the iguana tonight and eat raw chicken with my spinach and my crepe. Because the person behind the counter didn't know what he was doing. Well, I know you throw it on the pan, but I don't know how long. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So the same thing with our cameras. If we're going to go out there and say we're photographers, I'm going to expect you to start understanding some things. Okay? And it's really kind of confusing when someone walks in, whether it's here, or in my personal life, or at a job, and they see me shooting with my camera. You know, they don't understand what an aperture is. They don't understand, understand what shutter speed is. Because they get the camera, they figure they spent you know, $1,500 for the camera, or they figure they spent $300 for the camera, and they put it in you know, P for professional, so what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> P is 
I love when that works. <laughs> I hate when it's quiet in the room. The crickets. Um, P is a program mode. It's letting the camera do all this auto stuff. And basically, if it's not an M, you're in an auto mode. You're letting the camera make decisions. You're letting the camera look at things, not tied into your brain, think it knows what it's doing, and make a decision for you. And that's why you're spending so much time editing. Okay, if you had a, can, a can rep, uh, Brian Matsumoto, one of my good friends, can rep for many years, he would tell you that the more you tell the camera what to do, the faster your camera will react. Right? If you tell it, I want you to shoot at 125th of a second at f16 at ISO 100 with this daylight balance, when you push the button, what does it do? It just does it. It doesn't think about it. And most people that I know that shoot manually love manual. They love the control they've got over their camera. They love the consistent results. And that's what we need to do is get to that manual side. But to get to the manual, like to drive your car, car manually, we need to understand how to do it. I might be able to grind a few gears and get a car to move, but probably not. But anyway, here, it's, it's Easter morning. We're getting ready. And there's just this beautiful window over here, this huge, giant window over on this side here with sunlight beating on the curtains. OK, so it's daylight, but it's hitting ivory curtains, so it's got a little bit of warmth to it. OK, it's daylight, but it's not direct daylight. It's this giant curtain that's glowing in the living room now. So we get this really soft lighting. And how do I, what do I mean by soft? We start looking into these shadows areas. They're not black. And there's not a hard line between the highlight and the shadow. Whether it's on his face. Look, there's a shadow there. But it's not that dark, edgy one. There's not a huge difference between the amount of light from the highlight side and the amount of light from the shadow side. It's a soft, easy transition. OK? But because it's soft, we got a nice loop light on him. we got great catch lights in his eyes. I mean, I could retouch this. I'm sure at least one of you said, God, there's a light over here. Yeah, that's the kitchen light. This is out of the camera. This isn't, I made him look younger or softer or put catch lights in his eyes. OK? Just out of the camera, and that's why I love it. Just a simple, innocent photo of my son at, I think, five or six years old. Then I don't think he'll ever look that innocent again, ever in his life. <laughs> huh? Probably wasn't that innocent. Well, he wasn't back then, but <laughs> now he's 14 and a soccer player and dating a girl, and yeah. Um, but you know, but it, there's no real edge to this. But if we had, like I, I meet somebody sometimes and say, oh, I, I do child photography. I love doing child photography. Um, I don't need to understand ratios. I don't need to understand using my flash. That might be cold. Um, <laughs> but you do. Because if you look at those pictures later on, do you like the dark shadows on their faces? And if you don't, then why don't you fix it? Well, I'll fix it in Photoshop. Well, if you, if you shoot it right, it's much easier to fix it, because it's just done. It's taken care of immediately, right? When you, when you think kids, we think innocence, right? Right? You think fashion model, a little bit of an edge, right? You think bad guy, definitely edge, really dark shadows, right? So we need to pay attention to those things while we're taking the pictures, because we can make that person look more innocent or more that fashion look. You're with that bride all day long, right? We need her sweet and innocent. <laughs> we need her with a fashion edge, <laughs> right? We need a combination of things all day long, so we need to think about that. So some of that is we just need to pay attention to characteristics of light. That's one of the first things we really got to pay attention to, that just knowing that there are characteristics of light. Know that there are a number of things we should be paying attention to. Talked to someone just this weekend. Why are the teeth yellow in all of my photographs? Because you shot in the daylight mode with tungsten light. You set your camera for daylight, you shot in tungsten, everything's warm. Okay, but if you just shot it right, it'd be white. Right? Direction, quality, quantity, ratio. The two most interesting things, I swear, that I love the most would be going to be our direction of light and our ratios of light. And that's what I want to focus on the most tonight, are those two things. Because that's the stuff that really makes your photos. Am I out there doing award-winning prints? No. Am I competing? No. I'm not even shooting weddings right now. But Michael does compete. You have one person I know that definitely competes in the room. You have to worry about your highlights. You have to worry about your shadows. You have to worry about your patterns of light. You have to worry about your ratios, right? OK? Because if he submits a print for competition, and there is no distinguishable pattern of light, there's a direction, 
but there's no real pattern, portrait pattern for portrait people, mm. he's going to get a really bad review from the judges. Because there's an expectation, right? Our customers don't necessarily know. But if you're a hobbyist in the room, you should need to know so you can take pride in your work. How embarrassing to think you're making the, the, this big glamour meal and you found out really it's just Kraft macaroni and cheese and doesn't mean anything to anybody. You know what I mean? Your whole ego just gets deflated, right? Let's know what we need to do and get out there and do it. So if color of light, real quick, color, light at different temperatures <clears throat> produces a different color. Okay, tungsten's more of an orangey, if we think daylight, the camera's set for daylight. Tungsten's more orangey results, daylight's more neutral results. Okay, fluorescent, stereotypical fluorescent, more green results. So we need to know what it's doing. And if we tell the camera just to make the guess, an auto white balance, that's what it's going to do. It's going to try to get you as close as you can to that. Okay, but it won't be the most accurate. The best, most accurate way is how, Annette? Well, expo this is one way to go. That's, that's perfect. Uh, but custom white balance. Definitely. Find a way to custom white balance. And yes, some of you have asked me, would you shot a wedding? Would you really test and do custom white balance all day? Jose? We do, yeah. We yeah. yeah. But yeah, but simple, yeah. Every time I change my lighting condition, what have you just done? You've changed your lighting condition, right? So we're going to make sure that we're rea reacting properly to it to get the best results that we can possibly get. Okay, because if we batch process later on, that's the easy answer, right? I'll just put it in Photoshop, I'll batch process. Okay, so you shot for 14 hours <laughs> with varying light conditions. When you batch process, you're processing for one batch. How many batches do you think you created all day? A lot. Right, so you'll do the batch correction and you'll correct some of the photos and now you've got to spend all this time fixing all the rest of the photos. You know what I mean? The labs will love you. No, the labs hate you. They pull their hair out when they got to try to fix every individual image and hope that they're getting it right because they're going to send it to you and you're going to say, well, that's not what I wanted. You just, you just pay more. Yeah, you pay, but to get what you want. But you guys don't know what they want if you have to send it back to them and they didn't create it the way they wanted it, right? I'm not, I know enough. <laughs> my lab loved me because <laughs> my exposures were consistent. Colors, maybe not because it was film, but. You pay more. You pay more. I mean, you guys, it's, it's funny. You'll, you'll worry about where you buy this, what you do with that, and then you totally kill the one thing that's the most expensive thing you probably have, and that's you. I mean, think about it. I mean, how many of you guys actually shoot for money? How many of you shoot for money? Get your hand way up there. Okay, so pretty much just about the whole room shoots for money. Okay? Being in business is all about managing your resources properly. Okay? So let's just say you shoot a wedding for a thousand bucks. For some of you, you're like, holy crap, excuse me. <laughs> holy cow, a thousand bucks for a wedding, right? And some of you are like, thousand, what are you nuts? I'd never touch a wedding for a thousand dollars. But think about it. Think about how much your lens cost and your camera cost. And by the way, if you're shooting weddings, if you're shooting professionally anything, you should have more than one. And by the way, if your backup's like 10 years old, it's not a backup. It doesn't shoot anything like your new camera. So you need something pretty current, right? But like when I shot a wedding, it was five bodies I took with me. Okay, you can't say, excuse me, gotta go. Yeah, they were all mine. Okay, right? Three, four flashes. Okay, you got your cards, right? You got your car, insurance, right? Okay, at one point, you're making less than the guy at McDonald's is making. Okay? when you start throwing in that extra 14 hours after you shot for 14 hours to edit it, right? The lab, if you're using a lab to do all your stuff, they still need something to work with, okay? So yeah, the color is really, really important. So just do a custom balance. Use whatever tool you want to use. There's tons of tools. Last Light has something, Expo Disk. Um, there's generic Tupperware containers. You know, whatever you need to do, just whatever you use, use it consistently so you can get consistent results. That's the biggest word you should get out of tonight is consistency. Okay? Right? Emerald cooks. He pr cooks pretty consistently. Bam. Bam. All right. Direction. Direction of light gives us highlights and shadows. That's what gives us dimensionality. This is what the biggest thing to separate you from the amateur. Because the amateur is not worrying about getting the light off the camera. They've got a light in their camera already. Why would they buy another light? Right? I point it, I hit a button, a flash pops up, the picture's there. What's the problem? 
right? My iPhone, yeah, it pops the picture, right? We're good. But we can do amazing things with our iPhones, with our cameras. As soon as we start paying attention to the light, make sure the light's not coming from the same access point as the lens. So the lens is here, we don't want the light to come from here. Because oh. it's flat, so we don't want it from the same access point. You want your lens here and your light somewhere else. Because now it will create highlights and shadows. But again, we've got to be careful because if we're not careful, we can do bad things to people's faces instead of good things to people's faces. Okay? But yeah, it gives us texture. Everything we want to see is texture. How many, how many, Jerry, you've got multiple lights set up around the room, but it's for multiple reasons, right? You're getting dimensionality. Your backgrounds aren't going back dark. You're getting some light in the backgrounds, right? There's a, a few things that we're doing by getting these lights in multiple areas. And flash on camera would not do that. Flash on camera will expose for me, and then what happens to my background? Dark. It starts falling off dark, right? And I can pick up that background, what? If I use higher ISOs, if I use longer shutter speeds. But what if there's no more light in the room? If there's no more light in the room, I can do all those things, and it really doesn't do a whole heck of a lot because there's no more light to pick up, right? So that's why we understand light, and we can start using more lights. You know, you guys walk in and say, I want to do portraiture. How many lights do I need? Hmm. <laughs> How many want to buy? Right? Jose, right? Main, fill, hair light, rim light, edge light, kicker light, background light. There's different parts of the room you want to enhance in the picture. Those all require light so they can stand out. Okay? But it gets expensive really fast. And then you need to realize that if it's not expensive, it's not expensive for a reason. And you've got to worry about reliability on things. But more money doesn't necessarily always give you better quality. Okay? So this is back to Jerry saying light is light. That's where I'm coming from. Light is light. If I'm trying to sell you my light, okay, great. I can tell you why you should buy my light. But the reality is, is that fluorescent light is light. And right now it's not really good light on you. <laughs> but you know what? I can grab a bounce card and I can make the light come from a direction that I want it to to make it appealing for you. I heard Monty Zucker speak. You know, he had girls doing this weird stuff outside where they were like leaning way back with someone on the floor actually kind of holding her up so she wouldn't fall just so she can get her body and her face in the right position for the light that was coming down from the sky so that he could tilt the camera the way he wanted to tilt it to look like she was standing up and it was taken like this. Okay? But it was all about he knew where the light was coming from and how to position the person in relationship to that light to get the pattern that he wants. Why? Because it's not a mystery. Patterns of light consistently happen. If you put a light at this angle to someone's face, you will get this pattern of light. It's that simple. Quality of light. Do you want harsh, nasty light? This light's pretty edgy, um, but I can put a diffuser on it and soften it up. Um, I can shoot this light bare bulb at me. Harsh, dark, edgy, very noticeable difference between the highlight and shadow size of the picture. Or I can pop it into this guy up here, the beauty dish, which is one of my favorite reflectors, um, and the softbox. I like the soft, mushy lights, unless I'm trying to get something more dramatic and more edgy. Okay? And there's all kinds of toys you can buy for that. There's, there's Honol, there's Rogue flash benders. I'm sure there's 800 other products that have different names that you can put on your speed lights to go out there and shoot with. Okay? And the same thing when you start getting monolights or power packs. They make all kinds of reflectors for it, all kinds of adapters for it, so you can change the direction of the light, the quality of the light, okay, and have some fun with it. Um, someone walked in the night and said, hey, I thought you were going to focus on speed lights. I am. Because the reality is light's light. I can talk to you about monolights, and it's going to work with a speed light or a window light. Okay? Did you guys see the amazing light as you got here? Yes. Did you see the church across the street? with the hallelujah light coming out in the clouds? Oh my goodness. No, I was on my phone with my mother. Happy birthday. <laughs> Such a bad son. It's your birthday? No, it's her birthday. <laughs> no, I spent my, my birthday with you at a meeting on August 28th. Quantity of light. This is the one that most of you like, make yourself nuts about. It's the one you obsess about. Okay? You, you, for some reason, don't really worry about direction. Maybe not even color. A quantity makes you nuts. It's too hot. It's too, it's too underexposed. It's, it makes me crazy. Why do my pictures look milky and gray? Um, why is she so white? Um, because you're not paying attention to the quantity of your light. Okay, now this thing here, 
this thing pretty clearly gets brighter as it gets closer, right? And it gets dimmer as I pull it away. Here, you can hold that. Look at that. See? Dimmer, 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 right? Okay. So that's the basics of light that we have always worked with is that, that hot tungsten bulb in our, our lamp in our house, right? Even our window light, get close to the window, get further from the window. Now the cool thing is with flash, you guys can always have the right light. You can always have the right light in the right place. The funny thing is when you do available light, right? A lot of these available light people, love them, okay? Is that you need the right light with the right person, at the right time, with the right camera, set at the right settings to take the right picture, right? Imagine how nice it is when I want him to have Rembrandt light and I can just go, keep sitting like you're sitting with your funny face at me and just pop the light over there and get the pattern that I want whenever I want. That's the cool thing about this. If you ever start shooting off camera lighting, who shoots off camera lighting? Fantastic. So if you've shot off camera lighting and you see the results, how can you ever stop? I hear you. You can't. It's like a potato chip. You know what I mean? You just can't. <laughs> how do you stop? And for those people who hide behind the whole, well, I shoot available light because I'm an artist and, you know, shooting artificial lights inferior. You know, I saw your pictures and you still aren't a photographer. Your camera's still taking pictures. You're using and recording available light, but you're not paying attention to the color still. You're still making people look orange or make people look blue. You're still not paying attention to direction. You're still not paying attention to exposure. So I don't really buy into the, oh, I understand flash is scary. But once you start understanding that the flash does the same thing every single time, unless you tell it to do something else. It's more reliable than your wife, than your husband, you. than your dog, than your kids, right? You put it on full power, put it at 15 feet, it does the same amount of power every single time. Unless it's broke. No hormonal problems. <laughs> no hormonal problems. Don't worry, we've got our problems too. We get a little edgy once in a while. Um, okay, but the flash does the same thing every single time. When does it not do the same thing every single time? When your batteries aren't charged fully. Yes. Okay, that can do one. What's the other one? TTL. There you go, the Antichrist for Bill, right? Um, <laughs> TTL, the camera's making the decision. It's deciding based on the conditions. And again, the camera's making the decision. And so that Canon and Nikon and Sony, everybody else doesn't hate me, TTL can do a good job. Manual do, will do the exact job you tell it to do. Okay, and listen to Bob last month. He shoots TTL. But he shoots an awful lot of manual, doesn't he? From what he said, an awful lot of manual, because he knows exactly what it's going to do. Plain and simple. And that's where we need to get you to go, get you to be rather. So with quantity of light, we start realizing there's a number of ways that we can play with the quantity of light. It's like again, we're getting back to being chefs and cooks. We've got different ways of measuring the food. There is the anal retentive. They said a pinch. How much is a pinch? Is there a spoon somewhere that says pinch so I know that every time I want a pinch, I can put a pinch in? And then there's, pardon? Is there really? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I shouldn't be. There's a spoon? There's a spoon that says pinch. There is. I would love to see it. Um, and then there's like my wife, my mother, my grandmother, a pinch. They know exactly what to do. There's my wife cooking food. A little bit. Like she knows. Like she's really making everything, or whether she's making Kraft macaroni and cheese. I've never seen her read the box. Every time I make Kraft macaroni and cheese, I read the box. <laughs> okay? That's not my forte. So I make sure I read and do exactly what it tells me to do. Because of the macaroni, could you imagine for the kids if the macaroni and cheese didn't taste the way it was supposed to? I would never hear the end of it. Okay? So you've got to make it the right way. I made it wrong last time. You know, wife does the whole lean milk. I did full milk last time. She told me that she noticed the difference. <laughs> okay? So let's know the ingredients that go on. Inverse square law is really, really important to understand. This is, this is the foundation of shooting manual. Okay? This is the foundation. If you can understand the inverse square law, then, then we're good. We're good to go, okay? Inverse square law states that as we double the distance, your light falls down to a quarter. Every time you double the distance, it's just changed by quarter value, okay? And if we understand f-stops, that means it's just changed two f-stops. 
every time I double the distance. So if you know exactly how much light you've got at five feet, guess what? You will then be able to know exactly how much light you have at 10 feet and exactly how much light you have at 20 feet because the law of physics doesn't keep changing. It's not moody one day and say, hey, today I'm giving you F5.6. It does the same thing every single time, okay? So being a male and having my, my threat of laziness, God, this is so easy. If you can grasp this and understand it, suddenly photography becomes much, much easier. Okay? And like I said about when Jose started doing the off-camera lighting, once you do it, you don't go back. Once you start using off-camera lighting and really paying attention to it, you're like, why did I ever not pay attention to the light? Okay? So here, we know exactly. Point from here to here, we got one distance. There, we doubled it. We lost the light down to a quarter value. But we need to understand how the controls in the camera work to play with that. Okay, once your ISO, for those of you with brand new cameras, fantastic. You're shooting at ISO 1600, 3200, and it's just like you shot 100. <laughs> fantastic. For camera, you spend 600 bucks now. You're far superior than a camera you spent $10,000 on 10 years ago. It's amazing. It's really amazing. But they all have f-stops. These are your classic numbers. I'm an old guy. I hate all the numbers in between. <laughs> between five, six, and eight, you know what's there? Six, three, there you go, six, three, okay, and seven, one if you've got third stop increments. Or if you're an old guy like me, and this young chicken up here, <laughs> it's, it's five, six and a half, <laughs> right? It's right between five, six, and eight. You put your lens right there, you're good to go. And your film had, had um, had latitude to it, so if you're slightly over, slightly under, it was always very forgiving. And that's where we're starting to see more of the change in the cameras now as they're starting to become more and more forgiving of you not being quite right, okay? But every time we go from one stop to the next, the important thing here, every time we move between those numbers is to understand we've moved a stop, first of all. But every time we move a stop, we've doubled or cut in half the amount of light coming through, okay? So it's important to know. If we're going for aperture priority, why would you want to change your apertures? Shutter priority, why would you want to change your shutter? So this controls the light coming in, tied into those ISOs, right? We change for our ISOs, same thing, from 100 to 200 to 400 to 800, 800 to 400 to 200 to 100. You've doubled or cut in half the sensitivity of your chip. And you move from 1.4 to 2, 2 to 2.8, 2 to 8 to 4, 4 to 2.8, 2.8 to 2. You've moved one stop, you've doubled or cut in half the amount of light coming in. So it's two different ways you can double or cut in half the amount of light. You bought a lens, right? And the lens only goes wide open to f4. How do you get another stop of light in there? Bump the ISO up one stop. Right? Suddenly you're good. Uh, we don't have that as an option yet. All we've got is ISO and aperture, right? So we can't change the shutter speed. We can change the ISO and get more light into the camera. Okay, we can decide that our meter says f5.6, but I want more things in the picture to appear sharp, or I want less things to appear sharp. We can play with our ISO, which will then force our aperture to change, okay, and get the things in focus we want to. Apertures control two things, quantity of light, based on how big the opening is, and it controls depth of field what is perceived to be in focus in the picture. What do we perceive to be clear in the picture? Okay? Now, just to mess with you, depth of field is controlled by a few things. <laughs> we all learn about aperture and we're all, yay! Okay? Most people don't tell you that depth of field is also controlled by the focal length of your lens. Stronger lenses have shallower depth of field. Things go out of focus much faster with shallow, with um, telephoto lenses than with that normal lens. Okay? More things stay in focus with wide-angle lenses. That's why everybody's a great photographer, because all the little point-and-shoot cameras that we've grown up with are mainly wide-angle lenses. So just point it in the right direction, and most of what you're pointing at is going to be in focus. So that's why it works great for the amateur. And you're like, but I like my 85, and it doesn't work that way. Exactly, it doesn't. Focus, make sure you focus on the right thing. You'll get the picture you want, okay? Um, also, what's going to take care of that is going to be your relationship of how close you are to the subject 
versus how close you are to the background. Okay? If I'm close to you, but far to my background, it's going to go out of focus faster. Okay? So either go out and buy the $1,500 lens, guys, or learn that if you moved closer and focused, that would throw more of the background out of focus for you. Okay? I'm just saying, learn that you've got more resources than you think you've got. Okay? And another thing that kind of plays with it is your sensor size. There's a big argument and debate back and forth between those who know and those who know better and those who don't know. Whether your sensor size affects your depth of field, it's not so much that it affects your depth of field, it changes the cropping on your picture. Okay, so now your lens appears to be an 85, but your 50 that's appearing to be an 85 will not have the depth of field that the 85 has. Okay, so you got to be aware of these things when you're playing out there. Part of the reason people love the 5D Mark II was they got to use all these lenses with really shallow depth of field. But your crop sensors have a deeper reaction usually to depth of field. So if you want that maximum shallow depth of field, very minimal things in focus, go for the full sensor. Go for a telephoto lens, go for the wide open, and go for being really close to the person versus the background. Then you've maximized every way to make it shallow. Okay? That being said, realize that your focal length can really affect what a person's face looks like. Because <laughs> one, two, three of you have taken a class with me before, right? Four? How many of you guys have taken a class with me before? Cool. Um, one of the cool things that I like to do to you guys, just to mess with you and make you really learn focal lengths and how important they are to people's faces is, and this is something you guys can all do with somebody, is take your camera with that telephoto to wide angle lens. Okay? So I'm going to give you my camera, the 24 to 70. Okay? Here's my camera. And I want you to take a headshot of me. Actually, I want you to take three headshots. Take one at 24, take one at 50, take one at 70. But they're all headshots. They've all got to be cropped right here. Okay? So if I do that to you, what are you going to have to do? What's going to happen to you? If you have to, yeah, right there, I'll go for it. What do you have to do? Have to right, you've got to use that manual zoom, right? You've got to come closer and you've got to go further because you zoomed and you've changed what the camera and the lens can see now, right? Okay, so now do that. Trust me, for those of you who have the 18 to 55 kit lens who think that just because your camera can do it, you should do it, put an 18 millimeter in someone's face. But the best way to learn this is if I give you my camera, because when you give it back to me and I see how nasty I look at 18 millimeter, I won't ever do that to someone again. But if I had you take a picture of him with that 18 millimeter and you look at it later on, he's just some guy you sat next to in a seminar. I'm not really quite sure what he looks like. I don't remember if his nose was really that big or not. You know what I mean? But you know what you look like, right? And if someone made your cheeks all bulgy and nasty in a picture, ooh, not so good, right? That 85 is going to compress more. Right? And that 35 or that 12 millimeter is going to take your nose and wrap it around someone's face. I mean, that's how bad it is. The distortion. So we want to skip that. So f-stop relationships, again, we need to realize that when we move from one f-stop to the next, we've doubled or cut in half the amount of light. So that mindset right there, this is all getting the ratios, by the way. We start at this given point here. We moved. Okay? That means half the amount of light was out there, so we had to open up one stop. Quarter of the amount of light was out there, so we had to open up two stops to get the same amount of light to come in the camera. We getting that? We grasping that? Anybody not getting that? Because when I talk ratios, it's going to get all nasty on you if you don't understand this. You're okay. doing it or you're, you're losing light? You started at 5.6. By here? Yeah. We've doubled the amount of light coming in because oh. there's half the amount of light out there. What does it mean, half the amount of light out there? Where's the light? Is the light in your camera or out there? When you go to photograph me, oh. where's the light? Oh. Where's the light? It's out there, right? Your camera's just recording it. So based on what light's out there, determines what we have our controls at our camera to get the proper exposure. One of the best things that I ever started thinking about, guys, was exposure is this. Exposure is a box. Every time you take a picture, you're trying to fill up the box. It's the exact same size box every single time. Okay? If we fill up the box completely, what kind of exposure is that? Is that over, under, or proper? Proper. We fill up the box, it's properly exposed. As soon as we go out of the box, over. it's over. And if we didn't put quite enough in there, and there's a big empty space up here, under. it's under, right? How's that for simple? Every time, we've got to fill up the box. And we've got four different things that we can use to fill the box. Okay, I've told you two of them so far. What are they? ISO and aperture. I, aperture and ISO. Okay, 
Now we got shutter speed. Shutter speeds also are set up on our cameras in full stop, half stop, or third stop increments. You can play with your camera. Most of your cameras let you go into them and change them if you want to to full stop, half stop, or third stop. Okay, but most of your cameras are at third because it's finer detail, finer adjustments. It's like, do you put just a teaspoon of salt in to change your view? Or put a cup of salt? That's what it's doing. That full stop, half stop, third. Third's the finest way to do it. So same thing here. As we move from these numbers, one to the next, we've doubled or cut in half the amount of light. So now, when I've got my ISO at this ISO, my aperture at that, and there's not enough light or there's too much light, what can I use to change it? I can play with my shutter speed. Right? Longer shutter speeds let more light into the Less shutter speed. Did you guys read CPS this week? Someone had someone assist them on a wedding and they shot it a 30th of a second the whole time? Yes. <laughs> okay. Why would you shoot it a 30th of a second? Because well, you didn't understand, but why else? <laughs> You're trying to let more ambient light in. So rationally, that works. <laughs> if I'm using a tripod, photographing a vase of flowers that's not moving, no wind, okay. I can go slower and slower and slower, and I can pick up more light. When I shot film, 100 ISO, I tended to shoot at a 30th of a second for all my flash photos indoors. It picked up more light. When I went to 400, I still stayed at a 30th. It picked up more light. Flash froze all the action. I didn't have to worry about it. But now, you, you start worrying a little bit more. OK? I'm going to skip that one. We're going to go to this one real fast. Just to show you, the difference between these two pictures is the subject is the exact same f-stop. The exact same amount of light, but the photo on the right is a slower shutter speed. So by letting in a slower shutter speed, it picked up more light. Okay? So you got to play with these things and learn them. If you're shooting weddings, you better know this already. <laughs> My photos were ruined because the person didn't want they. Sure, I'll just go that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guide numbers. All right, this is where I see Jose and I bond now a little bit because when you're shooting manual, guide numbers are really, really important. Whether you call it a guide number or not, shooting manually involves you understanding what your flash does at a, a specific distance or at specific distances. Okay, we can figure out specific distance based on the inverse square law. That means we can figure out the other distances, right? Plain and simple on that one. We're pretty good on that one. So this is this is the whole base of the seven week class that I teach is understanding these. And when you walk into it at first, it's like, come on, really? Why are we going back to the Stone Age? This is too hard. This doesn't make sense. This isn't going to work. I had someone who's a pretty big wedding photographer tell me, I've been shooting for weddings for years. This would never, ever work. It, it does, guys. <laughs> um, this was here before we were here. It'll be here long after we're gone, and it'll still work. Okay? If I throw a ball at you, the ball is going to get there. If I throw a cup of water at you, the cup of water is going to hit you. That's pretty much what we're going for here. Okay? This much, the camera does this much. So how do you figure out your guide number? Number one is you read the manufacturer's website and then discard everything they said. Okay? Um, your, your guide number on your flash, typically from the manufacturer, is more geared towards if you shoot this camera, this flash, at telephoto, it's going to do this for you. Well, that's the strongest it can possibly be, oh. is telephoto, right? It's compressed the light so it can throw it further. That's the strongest it can be. How many of you guys shoot realistically at the telephoto of your flash for most of your day? No. no. How many shoot at your wide angle for most of your day? No. How many of you shoot somewhere in the middle most of the day? That's, that's all of us. That's why we love the 24 to 70. Mm -hmm. Covers most of our day. When I shot weddings, we shot three manual lenses. An 85, an 85, a 50, and a 35. After the 35, we started distorting. Nobody's face wants that, or group photo wants that. But most of the day, that 50 was on. Hardly ever did the other stuff get pulled out, unless I need it for that special condition. Okay, so here what you do is you take your flash, okay? You're gonna set your camera first of all. Camera's a manual. You might want to write it down because I'm not handing you a piece of paper. Camera's on manual. You're at ISO 100. And our white balance is custom white balance for flash or you set your camera to flash because we're using flash. Okay, that means our colors will be proper. We know there's a guaranteed ISO that we're shooting with right now. Okay? And we are telling the camera what to do so it won't do anything else unless I tell it to do it. 
How incredible is that to take an amazing photo and know that it happened because of you? Isn't that like the coolest thing in the world? You know, that photo is really great. Can you take that again? Uh, no, I can't. I have no idea what the camera was set at. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Or, man, yeah, I know exactly what I did. Yeah, that's loop lighting. That's about f5.6, blah, blah, blah. It's soft light, blah, blah, blah. You can go ahead and do it consistently every time. Okay? So that's it. Flash will be on full power. Okay? It's on manual because we're taking responsibility for what we're doing, right? Okay? What you're going to do is have your subject 10 feet away from you, preferably with something white on, something that we'd like to see detail in, like a white business shirt, which you're not wearing. I'm not that colorblind. Um, but it's got hems, buttons, buttonholes, collar, Fresh right? Paper. Fabric on fabric. No, this, is, this would be not good because there's no detail in this, right? Unless we really zoom in with the microscope, there's no texture to this, right? Okay, so I would not take that. But a white polo. We want some white in the picture. We want to see some detail, okay? And what we're going to do is, our camera set for ISO, 100, right? Our flash is on full power. We're how far away? 10 feet. 10 feet. And we're going to take a series of photos. Like, you'd be great right now, okay? You've got a white blouse on. There's folds to it. There's wrinkles to it. There's a, a hem on the collar here. It's got something I can work with, okay? Because what color is black? Black. So I don't need it. So I don't need black to be gray or white. I need black to be black and white to be white so I can see if I'm blowing out my, my highlights. Okay, that's what I'm really worried about. So I'm going to take a series of photos starting at F, whatever the widest aperture is my lens can handle. Okay? Get rid of your kids for a few minutes and just do this, okay? Widest aperture. And then you take a series of photographs starting at, and I don't mean, I mean a series of photographs. Take a picture. Change it to the next half stop. Change it to the next half stop. Okay? Realize if you're doing a third stop increments, you're taking a lot of pictures. Okay? But that's going to be the finest detail. Now what you're going to do is you're going to look at these photographs. Okay? And what we want to do is pay attention to that white area. You know, if it's just her white teeth showing and she has no vertical lines, we've obviously blown out her teeth, right? Right? If we zoom into the blouse and there are no folds, there are no wrinkles, there is no hemline, we've blown out the details. So we get to that point where we don't have blown out details anymore. So now you've taken that series of pictures. Pick an f-stop. F8. F8. So I took pictures at 10 feet. I got to F8. That's the perfect photograph. Why is it perfect? So I looked at it. I can see detail in it. Everything's there the way it's supposed to be. I'm happy. We can chit-chat about histograms if you want. But look at it. All the details there. We're, we're good. You took the picture at F8, you're at 10 feet, your guide number is 80. 10 times 8 is 80. Cool. Ding. I heard at least one light bulb just flicker on. <laughs> okay. So, if that's the case, if it's 10 feet F8. Could you repeat that? Repeat the entire thing? No. <laughs> I told you to take notes. You chose not to take notes. Jeez, so you're going to learn. Are you a parent? No. Okay, when you're a parent, you'll realize if you give people ultimatums, you've got to follow through on them. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll eat you alive in your sleep. Okay? So we're going back to that. Our flash is on full power. It's in manual. Our camera is on manual. It's at ISO 100. Okay? We're at 10 feet away from the subject. And we're going to take a series of photographs, changing our f-stop after each photograph. Okay? Start at one end of your lens. I don't care which end of your lens. Start at your f8 and go towards 1.2. Start at your 1.2, go towards f8. Okay? But you'll see somewhere in the middle... All things are good, okay? I'm not saying that every one of you with your flash at 10 feet will be F8. Some of you guys bought really cheap flashes. Some of you bought the one you could afford. Some of you bought the most expensive ones. Some of you were lied to about what it can do. How cool to know exactly what it can do, okay? I've heard of cameras that, you know, they, they sync at 2 feet of a second. That means the shutter is open, the flash pops at the same time, and you've got perfect coverage from corner to corner. Once in a while, a camera gets through that can't do 250th. And that little black line you see in your pictures, the window is already closing. So obviously 250th isn't your maximum seat, your sync speed if it, you're getting that black line. So either your camera's broke or it wasn't supposed to do 50th. So 250th. So you got how he got to the guide number? Right, okay, so the guide number, right, that 10 feet is really, really important. ISO 100 is really, really important. Full power is really, really important. Okay? But when I guide numbers at uh, 85 and guide numbers at 58. Your what? Guide numbers mentioned that they are at 85 or guide numbers mentioned that they are at 58. 
Okay, so if your guide number said it's 85, right. at 10 feet, your best exposure should be what? 8.5. 8 okay. If your guide number was 53, and if it's not, then at 10 feet, really it'd be 5.3 would be your best exposure, in theory. <coughs> if you shoot pictures and they're always overexposed at 5.3, they underrated it. Or it's just inconsistent, okay? If you're always shooting manual, if you're always at 10 feet, then it's always the same, okay? So if you go to 20 feet, what do we just do with the distance? We doubled it. So what happened to the quantity of light hitting the subject? You're about five feet. You're getting more towards the 10 feet. F8 hit you. How much light hits him? A quarter less. Four times less light hit him. So that means I have to do what? Close down or open up to let more light come in? I've got to open up. And how much do I have to open up? Two stops. See how easy that is? Isn't this fun? I'm totally geeking out. Some of you are like, I totally know this and you're wasting my time. And some of you are like, okay, that makes sense. And I can, I can grasp that, that if I put two scoops in, there's two scoops. What? Some of us are like, can't math. Can't math. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Like, it totally makes sense. But when I'm shooting, I don't want it to make sense. I just want to like, have muscle memory. I, 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 you know, if I have How do you get muscle memory? It, Practice. Repetition. Yeah. <laughs> Repetition leads to intuition. Write that one down. This is where having a Remember that one. Repetition leads to intuition. Why does my wife not read the box? She cooks more than I do. Right. She cooks macaroni and cheese more than I do. Okay? But she's intuitively able to just go and cook and know what adding this or taking that out is going to be. Like some people, they'll add salsa to their macaroni and cheese, and they know exactly how much salsa to put in there to get the little kick they want. And other people are like, salsa in my macaroni and cheese, are you nuts? <laughs> That's not the first time you go to, with someone for breakfast and they throw ketchup on their eggs. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing to that poor egg? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> really. I've got someone that I work that puts hot sauce on everything he eats. Of course. And he's peppers on everything he eats. Uh, yes, Jen? Wouldn't it make sense just to, if you're shooting flash and manual mm -hmm. to, um, just adjust accordingly, you know. Uh, so for shooting manually, just the flash accordingly, what, can you help me out a little bit more? I'm not trying to argue, I just want to understand. On my flash, the 550 Canon, mm -hmm. you can go a third of a stop less, mm -hmm. a third of a stop more. Mm -hmm. So if you know mm -hmm. what's But if I'm going to shoot a photo right now of Jose with my flash that's got a guide number of 80, what f-stop would I put it at to get a proper exposure of him? Okay, so he's more in that 12 to 15 range now. Okay, so my guide number is 80. He's getting more in that 560. Well, next year he's getting more towards a 56. 15 feet's about 56. The guide number of 80. Okay, okay, but but no, and that's good. That's your technical just popped out, and that's fantastic. Okay, but see, if I took that picture right now, I would go 56. Okay? I wouldn't go 2.8. Well, it puts you in the ballpark. Okay? Sorry. Right, but I wouldn't put it in 2.8. Right. I wouldn't put it at 22. I would know that based on its distance, it should be about here, and I can start there, and now I can do what you said. Now I can tweak it a little bit if I want to. But if we have no clue what it should be, You're giving us how do you get in the right neighborhood? Yes, I can join you for breakfast at your house Tuesday. I'm going to wander the, the city until Tuesday trying to find your house, because I have no idea where your house is. Right? But if you told me the address, I could probably show up and be there on time. Right? Same thing here. I can nail the picture if I know where it's supposed to be, and I can tweak back and forth. She said she lives in Jefferson Park. Well, why would I drive to Orland Park if you're in Jefferson Park? Right? Helps me get more in that right neighborhood, and then we can tighten it up if we want to. So I'm all with you on that. Okay? But this will get you there most of the time. And if you're off a couple tenths of a stop, Trust me, digital is still saving your butt. You're fine. You're totally fine. When you're off half stops, when you're off full stops, and you guys have seen it, right? That was a full stop off, and I just fixed it in Photoshop. It'll look like you're there, but you'll be losing something on one end or the other. But if we get closer to that neighborhood, we got a heck of a lot more data that we can play with and use for our pictures. And if you have a good base, you don't have to always change the flash. You could. Because it's all about the base. It's all about the <laughs> <laughs> But well, you can now move your ISO, or you could do. Okay. Pardon? What's the point of shooting manual flash if you're? 
Shooting manual flash will get me consistency. I know that at 10 feet it's always F8. And it's not F8 if he's wearing black and F5.6 if he's wearing blue. It's always F8. Okay? Because that's the part we haven't talked about yet is how metering screws you up and messes up what's going on. Because your white shirt's completely different than her black sweater. And your white skin, your Caucasian skin, is different than his African American skin, which is different than his Hispanic skin, which is different than his Indian skin. Well, I pointed it at the skin. Shouldn't I get the same? No. And if I had a dozen African Americans in the room, it wouldn't be the same for each person. A dozen Caucasians, we're all a little bit different. Get that nice Italian skin with a little bit of, you know, olive in there. You know what I mean? You get the Hispanic and the good sun. I mean, they're all different. So we got to make sure we pay attention to it. So the guide number is what we're really important. And then once we figure out what that guide number is, we now know that we start changing ISOs, how that affects the picture. Because the ISO, right, remember, I double or cut in half the sensitivity. Well, same thing here. I know that this is a long way to get there. 10 feet F8 with ISO 100 is 10 feet F11 with ISO 200. 200 is double sensitive, so let's double the amount of light in. So what, I have to close down one f-stop, right? I'm squeezing in a two-day class here on you guys. <laughs> okay? He's like, yeah, you are. By the way, you all owe him $45. <laughs> Send it to my wife. Um, <laughs> okay, so we start playing with the ISOs to start getting us where we want to be. When I first started shooting, it was all about, this is the important thing now, we said we're going to change distance. Right? Well, that changing distance involves changing the distance of the light. Right? So if I get closer, the light's getting closer. If I get further, the light's getting further. All right? Um, but as I get closer, what happens? The light gets brighter, right? So I have to close down. And as I get further, what happens? The light gets weaker, so I have to open up, right? And we know now, based on the inverse square law, how much it has to. The problem that comes in with this way of shooting, <coughs> excuse me, the good news is the exposure is always on. The bad news is, that by changing the exposure constantly, we've changed the relationship of the available light to the flash light. So the flash is properly exposed. That available light, when you start looking at my backgrounds, my backgrounds are all over the place. They're brighter, they're darker, you're shooting in a cave. The person's probably exposed, but the whole church looks black behind them. You took a full length picture of her, and you can see everything in the background. So did someone turn the lights up and down while we were taking photos? Now, anybody shooting weddings in this room, that's an option, right? That has happened. Church just says you're done, they turn the lights out, and you're just like, nope, I'm still shooting. <laughs> but it's my wedding. <laughs> Cry to him, not me. Okay, but how do we get around this? The great way to get around this is, Jan mentioned, you can tweak your flash. Okay, so another way we can control the light is by turning the flash up and down. Like with me, if I were shooting the average picture, and I'm getting them where that eight foot range, my flash is on like 16th or 30 second power. It's nowhere near producing full power. And by doing that, it allows me to get the relationship between my flash and my available light closer together. Okay? If your room light's F4, your full length's at 15 feet 5 6, what's the difference between your flash and the available light? One stop. We're picking it up just fine. When I come in for that five foot shot, now I'm at F16 for my flash, right? My flash is hitting you. If I want to expose properly, I've got to get to F16. What's my room light? It's still F4. What's the difference between F16 and F4? A whole lot of stops. So now we're not picking up that available light. So now your five foot shots are all black in the background. Your full length shots are showing the background off. So the way to get around this is, Jan, play with your flash. Realize that when I turn my, fla my flash power up or down by a one stop increment, I've doubled or cut in half the amount of light. I'm maintaining, why am I doing it that way versus just a third? I'm maintaining this relationship between all my controls. Okay? They all do the same thing. They all double or cut in half what's going on. It makes it easier to tr let one come in through here and cut back on this one. Because this box right here is all about us having the ISO and the shutter speed and the aperture. Right? But we got to control the light. Okay? So what I like to think about, how many guys have taken a photo class? They always talk about the, the exposure triangle, right? I'm like, no, it's an exposure square. <laughs> right? What did Jerry say before we started? Every photo needs what? Light. So how can we keep leaving light out of the formula for figuring out exposure? 
right? That's crazy. Though. If I want it brighter, move the light closer or further. I've got that option. Turn the power up. Turn the power down. Put some diffusion in front of it or not in front of it. We've got a fourth ingredient we can play with all the time to control the quantity of light hitting our subject. Third to a half of a stop with this picture of your son because it was diffused by the curtain. Yeah, it made it so nice. Easy transition from the highlights to the shadows. So what I like to think about is I like to think about, just to get my wife mad, I like to think about Lisa. 